facilitate? Does anybody want to step forward and be scribe? Oh, scribe? Thank you, Christina. Got my laptop. <laughs> See that right there? <laughs> so you're wait, that's 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 I was looking around. Somebody's going to say something. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we actually have two sets of minutes to approve because the uh, commission has had two meetings recently. The full commission meeting, uh, which was January 8th, but there was also the work group meeting. Uh, which we knew wouldn't be the full commission, but it was an official commit, you know, commission meeting. Um, uh, and it's my understanding, you know, it worked to get the full commission meeting, we have to have minutes of it, so. They have minutes, but it's a subcommittee. It's a subcommittee, yes, yes. but it's still. You probably didn't have a quorum for a full committee. Yeah, there was no quorum. It wasn't, there wasn't a quorum there. It's a little, I'm a little baffled when you read exactly what it's supposed to be. Quite frankly, if, where is it, the city ordinance I read? Basically says the editor, you know, no commissioner or board can meet without a quorum. If you don't have a quorum, you can't meet. Right. That's why you, it made sense to be a subcommittee. <laughs> but you, you have to advertise. And so is it? Did I meet as? A, did we meet as a subcommittee? Do we meet as a full commission? No, not as a subcommittee. Yeah. Okay. Subcommittee. And that's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of lots okay. Thank you. Very good. Now subcommittees. Okay. Well, in that case, we will um, we'll adjust it. We will uh, <coughs> vote on the second one as a subcommittee. Well, then they should go to that. Yes, that's what I mean. Yeah. When next time. At their, comes, next, at their next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, <coughs> so I'll welcome a, a motion to approve uh, the minutes of uh, January 8th. So moved. And is there any seconds? Second. And then, okay. Any comments, discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Station abstentions? No. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Just a quick announcement. Um, so last time I did mention the who's terms are coming to an end. Mary uh, Biddle has reapplied, so I'm uh, assuming that she will continue being on the energy commission. Um, and after speaking with Brian, um, Brian Bruce, uh, he's going to be out of town for months at a time, and he's decided that he's uh, going to. Um, uh, move off to a uh, an associate position, and um, yeah, Christine is going to take the full membership position. Assuming so, let's go this way. Uh, the mayor is going okay. to appoint her and bring her to city council, and at that point, uh, she will be. <laughs> see what happens. Right, exactly. We'll see what happens. Huh? I have a feeling you're going to have to do some hard print <laughs> Okay, so that's just a little piece of uh, of news there. and. Um, uh, and so Wayne's going to take an opportunity to really let us get filled in on the Star Communities piece. Okay. It should. Yeah, I'll let you introduce your own. Okay. Go ahead. So I'm going to walk to so you all. We had some session at Star Community here before. It's just, it's the rain. You know, they, their stated purpose was to be for municipalities what lead is for buildings. Sort of be the accepted standard for measuring municipal sustainability efforts. Um, and so we got involved with the process because we wanted to sort of look at what are all the things that, that New Hampshire does that's sustainable? Um, you know, it's interesting the community, whenever there's a public debate, everybody comes up to the table and says, it's all about sustainability, and then everyone has a different definition of what sustainability is. So if you want development close to downtown, sustainability is about walking neighborhoods. If you don't want development close <laughs> to downtown, it's about having open space for stormwater to go in. <laughs> and, and, and so we wanted to have sort of an outside set of measurements so that we could sort of compare ourselves to our peer communities, see how well we're doing, get ideas about other, what other communities are doing, see what works, what doesn't work. Frankly, one of the things that we've discovered and other things we've done, like being a bicycle friendly city and a pedestrian friendly city, is the better we do, <coughs> the easier it is politically for department heads and for the mayor to acknowledge all the things we don't do. You know, if we can say, look, we're beating 95% of the communities out there, but we know we can do a much better job it sort of makes it easier. So that was part of the motivation for this as, as well. Um, we scored much better than we thought we would. So far, about 30 communities have been rated. A lot more communities going through the system, but 30 have gone through it so far. And just us in Seattle have been five star of the highest ratings. The rest have been three star or four star communities. Um, and that may change over time, but interestingly, some of the communities we would have thought were really leaders, um, uh, Austin, uh, Texas, uh, Portland, Oregon, didn't rate as well as we rate. Now, some of that is just sort of how good a job we do doing for the application. Some is some unique things about us. So we do really well in urban areas, in urban things. 
deal with, with low-income individuals and having homeless shelters that Portland can do. And we also do a great, great job at preserving open space that some big cities can't do because there's not much open space to preserve. So some things are unique about it right now. Wayne, do you mind questions in between? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, I'm wondering if uh, anybody, any other Massachusetts communities have gone through this. So no one's completed it. Okay. Um, Cambridge plans to, Boston looked and decided it wasn't worth their time. So Boston's not doing it. Cambridge is going through it. That's the only other one right now. Um, uh, Burlington, Vermont. So these are often, I mean, usually, the, even though we we're only 30 have gone through it, the ones who do it are typically the leaders. So, you know, Cambridge is, Cambridge and Boston are two communities that give us a run for our money. Cambridge is doing it. Portland, Maine is going through it. Burlington, Vermont's going through it. Albany has already gone through it. Um, not for the New England, but so I think that's it for the New England communities. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to rate, take you through the process quickly and sort of give you a sense of what it is. A lot of slides, and we'll turn very quickly at the same time the introduction will go through. But just quickly, sort of why we, one of the reasons we started this, this goes back to that greenwashing thing. So this is really exciting news. So right Hampton is the first lead gold Taco Bell in the entire country. Um, and it's absolutely true that if you look at a Taco Bell compared to the McDonald's next door, their carbon footprint is smaller and they're doing all these wonderful things. But nonetheless, they don't pay wages that are livable and that's part of sustainability. Everybody drives there and that's part of sustainability. <coughs> Most likely in 20 years from now, that building when it's obsolete will be torn down. Mm -hmm. Buildings like that don't get redone and that's part of sustainability. So it's great, but it certainly shows the limits of the lead system, again, much better than McDonald's next door. Um, you know, so I, I like to slide below it because sort of that's a durable building built 140 <laughs> years ago, and yet when it didn't work for a site, it gets moved. You know, that's not going to happen to the Taco Bell site. The, the PV on top, we've all talked about this here about how important conservation is versus renewable energy. I think they're both important, but you know, if you interview people in the community, a lot of people would say sustainability is about rooftop solar. And that's obviously a piece of it, but not a bit. So, we, so that's again, that's sort of one of the, the piece, bigger piece. So the process is, and I'm sorry the slides are being cut off, this projector's a little warped. Um, but the way the system's set up is there's seven goals. So you can see that, they're not cut off, but you can see that the goals, you know, built environment and natural systems. Um, the ones that you guys focus on most often is that second one in blue, climate and energy. But they're sort of defining all these things as sustainability. This is sort of a, a national discussion that went on to create this process. And then under these goals, there's 44 objectives. There's 526 metrics. That's what we had evaluated as all 526 of these metrics. And I promise you, I would not go through all 526. So even though you see a lot of stuff, I'm sort of racing through a lot of them. But what's interesting about our scoring system is um, we did well in every category and not spectacularly well in any category. So I think it says a lot about <coughs> the where there are probably going to be leaders in the country that beat us in any one category, but there's not that many communities that beat us across the board. So we sort of we focus on a, on a broad you know a broad look at all these things. The other thing, just when you see the slides, I give I went to we had a discussion about you know where sustainability functions located in the city government. So I went through, I just located the departments who are involved in each of these things. We know, and we're very aware of this, that a huge number of our points are things that our partners are doing. Some of these are partners that we have formal agreements with, like CET, so the, the concierge program. A lot of partners are just out there doing things by themselves. And for this, we claim credit for them. We get no, you know, League of Women Voters does a lot to bring out people to vote. We have absolutely nothing to do with helping. Um, that's true for a lot of these. So I'm showing you all that, but I'm not trying to claim credit. This is as a, as a community, we're a great community. That means both city government and the nonprofit sector. And we're, and we're well aware of that. Uh, and then because Paul's in the room, I, I'm listing the agency who takes the, the, the lead in these things. Most of these things go through city council. So the fact that city council isn't on every slide isn't a slight to them, it's just sort of, you know. So things like, Plastic bags, I list city council on this because they're taking the lead in this as opposed to everything else that they vote for. Um, so again, I'm going to go through this quickly. There's seven metrics. Built environment is how, how planning is probably most involved with these things. It's everything from sustainable transportation, that obviously involves DPW, to land use patterns. Um, and you know, so the, it was interesting the process is it's the one that you can really see what makes Northampton a unique city in a, a built environment. But there were some things that were, that were hard to rate us. So one that I found particularly interesting is single occupancy vehicles. 
we have about 65% of our trips, I forget the exact number, where people commute to work by single occupancy vehicle. If you look at this nationally compared to any large city, we do horrible. So compare us to Austin or Boston or, you know, we do horrible. On the other hand, if you look at cities of 30,000 people, we do spectacularly well. And so part of this norming is you know, how poor our peers are across us. We are really impressive for tiny little towns, but obviously not a lot. How is that measured? Was that? How is that measured? They do it just by single occupancy vehicles. So for that one, we didn't get credit. But how is it determined? How oh, it's journey to work, and journey to work is the only one we have data for. Okay. So it used to be the census long form until 2000. You had a 10% chance of getting a long form in the census. They got rid of the long form, now this is community housing survey. And so they ask you, how do you get to work today? Um, so it doesn't do any other tricks. And then one of the things we realized in the, in the sustainable Hampton plan is the plan was really good, the metrics of the plan were not that useful. And so one of the things we decided is we redo the plan, we're going to replace with metrics from STAR that was compared to other things. So I'm going to raise these, just to give you an idea of these things, I'm not going to spend any time on these. But so we're looking at ambient noise. Um, and we're a relatively quiet city. We don't get a lot of credit for that, um, other than buses going through Main Street. We, a lot of these are measured downtown. So we just <coughs> barely met the standard for not being noisy. We don't do much for that. Um, but there's little things the city does, you know, from we have noise standards in our zoning, we have uh, light standards, we did a, a public education campaign, buildings with a lot of enforcement. So this one you see is sort of planning and building. Just as to give you an idea, there's like 58 of these, one for each category. So I'm not going to spend as much time in this to show you. So community water system, this is all DPW. They're all doing a great job. They could give you a lot more details that, than I could. Um, some of these are required by law, like yes, we comply with EPA standards, and we aren't in trouble for that. Um, and some are not. Some DPW is doing a lot more than you. So you can see across the board, compact and complete community. This is, in essence, our downtown. Um, and so this is about building a density. This is one of the things we've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years is increasing the density downtown. So the land use stuff is mostly planning, although city council took some really courageous votes on this process. The, the street standards, where there's sidewalks, what's walkable is DPW. Um, so all these things that come up to making a complete community. You can go online and see walk scores, um, and you can see it basically this is pretty close to walk score. Your walk score is 90 or above, which our downtown is. You do well here. If your walk score is 30, you do it for um, affordable housing, again, you can see, see the partners on these. The main things to look at these, unless you care about details and interrupt me if you do, is sort of the top line, you know, what we're talking about, who the partners are, and then you get sample pictures and projects. Um, so the city has been very involved with affordable housing. Uh, in film redevelopment, again, this is about density downtown and all the different steps that we do in terms of how do we spend our block grant, how do we spend TIF funding, how do we get uh, Brownfields grants to get into the walking areas. Public spaces, this is, the two agencies are, are conservation and recreation. My office is planning for, with both agencies, so we have a lot of open space, as open space, as parks and recreation. We meet all these things. You know. Their standard, for example, is how much the city is within three miles of a, of a bike path. Well, 100% of the campus is three miles of bike path. Our own metrics is half a mile from bike, bike path, and we're about 65% under our metrics. Transportation choices, again, this, this fits the comment I made at the beginning, that we have a lot of choices, even though the majority of us still drive to work with some of these vehicles. But again, for community our size, we do a good, a good thing. There's some places where the data is random, doesn't help us. So we got points for moving towards zero bicycle pedestrian deaths. That's totally random, just so you know. We peak at about two bicycle and pedestrian deaths, and we typically are about 25. So, some years we go up, some years we go down, we happen to be, and the five year trend we looked at, we happen to go from two to zero, but it could be that next year we'll go from zero to two. So that one, even though you claim credit for in the score, we don't really deserve credit for. Uh, but most of these are real, and we're certainly moving towards it all. So climate and energy, this is the category which you guys obviously spend the most amount of time on as, as a board. Um, and just to think about a couple of things. One is, we did really well in this category, but it's largely because Chris could show great data on how we're moving towards, you know, dramatically reducing our carbon footprint. The city has reduced energy use by 20%. Even it's not exactly true because you do a trend line. Yeah, we dropped 20% in city buildings, but we're not going to drop to zero percent. You know, we sort of we dropped and now we're there. 
And so some of these things get a lot harder going forward. Um, and so we, you know, so Seattle, for example, and I think Burlington have both committed to be net carbon neutral cities. They both have municipal power plants. It's easy for them to completely control the sources. Um, and likewise, we have a lot of credit because things that Massachusetts has done. So in terms of requiring solar power, that wasn't really things that we did. Um, and the part that's interesting looking at is, is, is the scale of things. So there's the microgrid work that, that Chris has done and got the really large grant for thinking about DPW and including Dickinson. But we've also we changed our subdivision regs, planning board did, the DPW approved, to require street trees. We, we still have street, any tree that would thrive <coughs> in a country could be a street tree for a subdivision. Now we want to be the northerly end of the climate range for that tree. So the trees that could survive from Northampton to North Carolina. So as our climate becomes more like North Carolina, those trees survive. It's a small step, but if we're thinking about trees that live, you know, a long, long time, how we move towards it. And then the biggest gap in here, which is what where we're moving forward in the next year, is a climate adaptation. <coughs> not the mitigation we've done a great job on. So I'm not gonna go through these, you discuss this as a committee. A lot of these things you see the lead is energy, which is the shorthand for Chris, and then this commission. So Greenhouse gas emissions, green gas supply. Again, state partners as well, nonprofit partners but from the city standpoint. Really. Industrial resource efficiency, we're not doing a lot, but what we're doing is coming through here through the concierge program. Um, uh, uh, resource efficient buildings. So, this is sort of a lot of the, the stuff, mostly the uh, building department in terms of getting the word out. Obviously, city, I'm sorry, this is the building stock. So we have incentives to get people to be lead buildings. At Taco Bell, for example, would have owed us a small amount of money, about $10,000 in um, uh, traffic mitigation. We waived that in return for them going to, to uh, green, you know, being a goal to kind of build. So different steps that we take in terms of these things. Resource efficient buildings, again, you all know this um, in detail. Waste minimization, this is primarily all the stuff DPW is doing from traditional <laughs> recycling to electronic recycling to the cooler stuff I like in terms of, you know, swaps and book swaps, all those different things that, that, that we do. So, um, uh, economy and jobs, the next area is economy and jobs. This one is the hardest for a small city because so much of what we're doing relies on regional trends. You know, we, we're not going to have a huge effect on the environment. And, and I say mayor because the city's economic development coordinator is in the mayor's office. So a lot of these steps are in the mayor's office. Obviously, again, a lot of these are part of city council approval. We're doing well on some of these things because the specific actions the city's done. Well on some because of total randomness, the economy's doing well, and for them, some that don't show up here. Green market development, again, some things from lead score. You guys are part of that overall conversation. Local economy, again, mayor's office. Um, you know, and some of these, again, were marginal. So if I get two bids for the same thing, the tiebreaker is how local somebody is but I can't actually spend more to hire someone locally. <coughs> so some of these things are like, yeah, we do a little bit, we get credit, but this is only cap to that much. I'm not sure we're making a lot of decisions based on those kinds of things. Um, living wages, so we hit the quality of having a living wage policy, but our policy is just, it would be good to pay a living wage, it doesn't have any teeth behind it. But there's other steps that we do, we allow unions, we allow those kinds of things. Target industry, this is really my mayor's office, where the outreach been, for specific group, you know, specific kinds of business we're trying to attract. Workforce readiness, most of this is the state, the state's doing most, you know, most of these efforts. The one thing the city gets a lot of credit for, both the, the last mayor and then both city council and current mayor, has been the efforts we've done in James House, is really trying to create adult education, some which is about workforce readiness. So the city <laughs> has gone sort of beyond the call of the those things. Next area is a broad one, education, arts, and community, lots of partners. Um, uh, arts department used to be called the Arts Council is the lead on a lot of these things. You know, we have a new arts district. Um, but again, a lot of these we don't really get credit for. You know, the, the Calvin is one of the arts venues. We don't do much about the Calvin, but we have one of the few, you know, Academy Music is one of the few city buildings like that. So we do a lot of investment in those kinds of, of areas. Um, community cohesion, this is sort of a catch-all and covers a lot of different categories. This is everything from the mayor having teas, you know, and coffees in the neighborhoods and working with all the, the ward associations that he does, to the community gardens work that both my office and recreation does, to the things that we get no credit for, the, the neighborhood associations, um, to just all the buildings that the city owns that we encourage people to use. So all part of that, that building, you know, that, that sense of community out there. Um, 
education assists heavily schools, <coughs> but certainly not exclusively schools. Um, so things like funding for supporting Head Start, you know, the city leases at one dollar a year of the old elementary school in Vernon Street. We lease another building on, on Riverside Drive for preschool. So there are lots of individual things the city does over and above, you know, what the school department does. Historic preservation. Um, this is primarily my office. Um, obviously, city council approval. So lots of different efforts in this process, mostly regulatory, some non-regulatory. Um, Oh, one, it's a, they, they measure you by outcomes and by actions, and I merged them all together because it didn't really matter here. I forgot to merge these two slides here. So outcomes are things, how are we doing already? How many people are actually attending an art event? That's an outcome. Actions are what are we doing to get more people to attend? Um, so, th so if you looked at outcomes, Boston would do better than we do in things like transit because they have a lot more transit. But we need to do a lot better than them in terms of actions and trying to move forward in some categories. Um, so social and cultural diversity. This one is partially the city, so there's a lot of this. This is also very heavily the community, and a lot of the diversity. You know, we are pretty, not particularly diverse, racially or ethnically. Uh, we're about 85% white. Um, but certainly that 15% is active. Certainly gay and lesbian community, which qualifies for diversity under this, is very active. So there's lots of diversity out here. Certainly acceptance, I think, is a very real thing. Um, equity empowerment. This is one that we didn't do as well as we would have liked, although interestingly, we did better than most communities because everyone does poorly in this area. So we spent a lot of effort on block grant and on other efforts. So the thing on the left was um, you know, our effort for brownfields, trying to clean up brownfields closer <coughs> to neighborhoods. Um, and we just do little symbolic things. We sold six lots on Garfield Avenue. We gave five to Habitat for Humanity. This is right next to an old landfill site. Um, but we sold one for market rate, and we very deliberately sold the one that was closest to the landfill for market rate. And that was partially symbolic. We wanted to send a clear message that, yeah, poor people live next to old landfills, but rich people do too. We don't discriminate, and we want to put them on. So we, we just sort of think about it everything that we do. We're trying to get a targeted uh, community garden now next to Riverrun Apartments, because it's the largest complex in town with no sidewalks and no way to get places. Uh, you know, car, low car ownership rate. Bill on the right is the old Elks building. And at the time, this is now five years ago, um, it had the most expensive condos in the city on a per square foot price, but the basement was a homeless shelter. Um, and that was really possible because we put a lot of block grant money into the building. So lots of efforts sort of that deliberate thing. We don't, we don't look at poverty and isolation and sort of think about how these things all, all fit together. Uh, so I'm gonna go through these quickly. Civic engagement. A lot of this has changed, all the things that legal women voters do. I don't think we do, we've done a lot in this area, but we actually have a pretty good voter turnout, so we don't have a lot to complain about. Human rights, we do have a human rights commission. Please don't get a lot of complaints, but there's a, there's a forum for those things. Environmental justice, what I was just talking about, we, we very, when we buy open space in particular, we look at, I mean, when we deal with brownfields projects, we look at who's being served and trying to make sure that we're serving everybody, that everybody lives in walking distance of open space. Um, Apple Service, this is a, the first gay marriage and the first legal in Massachusetts. You know, Northampton was one of the first <coughs> weddings for it. But how do we deal with those sorts of things? Um, poverty alleviation, this is heavily um, CBG, or CBG's dwindled. Um, CPA has picked up some of this, and then obviously our community partners. Just the fact that the mayor is willing to write letters of support for projects that in Holyoke would be incredibly controversial is alone you know, an effort. We had um, needle exchange program years before Holyoke was willing to even consider it. Um, and that sort of fits in some of this category. Um, health and safety, lots of different partnerships. Um, here, and these benefit different categories. Health and safety is everything from traditional health issues to police and fire to having sidewalks so people can walk um, places. So again, the partner, active living is the term for sidewalks and bike paths and ways for people to exercise. The metrics for, under this one is at least 21% of adults in the survey report exercising for leisure activities, which is not true in a lot of places. And then all the stuff we've done for, for sidewalks and for bike paths and school-based uh, education. Um, community health systems. This is our health department, primarily Cooley Dickinson Hospital. So other than the health department does not a lot of cities doing in this area, but certainly some. Um, we're part of a regional collaboration. This mass in motion, Northampton, my office is a lead community for a four-town effort, Amherst, Northampton, Belcher Town, and Williamsburg. And the money all runs through us because we want to get, you know, promote some of these healthy living activities. 
So a lot of stuff that police and fire do do a really good job. It's sort of fun, you know, I think for the police and fire, I haven't really thought of what they're doing as being part of sustainability. It's really part of the definition. How good a job do we do? And they do a really good job on training and response time and, and all those other things. Um, access to healthy food. Um, the city does some of this. Certainly we're at the Grow Food Northampton got a lot of the points. When I talk about things that our partners do, Grow Food Northampton increased our score significantly <coughs> in this area. Um, but the health department's done a lot of work getting food stamps <coughs> accepted at uh, farmers markets. We have, you know, um, three farmers markets in Northampton. So a lot of these things we do well at. Um, indoor air quality. This one's more chance. You look at complaints for indoor air quality, and the school department again went from one complaint three years ago to zero complaints last year. It doesn't. So that one I don't see as a real thing. I just that's that's the chance of being a small city. But you know we don't allow smoke in our buildings. We just created buffers on our M City Hall last year. So a lot of things that we do control, we, we do do a good job in these things. Um, natural and human hazard, uh, and this is really sort of these three departments here, but lots of efforts. I got this later in the slide, but you know everything from we're required to be eligible for floodplain insurance to have certain regulations within our 100-year floodplain. We have those same regulations in our 500-year floodplain. It's sort of a surrogate for climate change. Um, the, the work that Chris is doing on the, uh, the microgrid to make the vote better survivable in, in, in a big storm is part of this process. Obviously, all the work that DPW does. So lots of different you know, areas can come into play. Um, safe communities, this is primarily what the police does but also sort of increasing <coughs> efforts that housing authorities involve with as well. Natural systems are the ones that's easiest. Again, this is the way we are, have a lot of rural land. But this is a, their green infrastructure, the way they define green infrastructure for this, is tree canopies, wetlands, buffers, and open space. And we do really well. Partially with the state law, and partially with the land that we do. Invasive species, we actually think we're doing a horrible job, but compared to a lot of other towns, we're doing a good job. Um, we, we're losing ground every year, a little bit less than other towns are losing ground every year, which isn't something to be proud of, but at least we, you know, we're spending money, we're doing detailed assessments, we're doing cleaning these things up. Natural resource protection, a lot of this city, this is, is DPW, particularly for the watershed lands and for the stormwater regulations, my office in terms of natural air protection and, and restoration, and then our partners like Mass Audubon, doing property sector. Uh, indoor air, outdoor air quality, again, largely we have no control of this. This is, you know, what, they, what they're burning in the Ohio River that comes here. But the air is, and so some things like the non attainment days, we look at often we get credit or we don't get credit. But where they give you credit is things like that we have a transportation management association to promote non sing occupancy vehicle trips. That, so there are steps that we're doing. Um, you know, Ned's office done a lot of signal timings and upgrading intersections so there's less queue on there. So the things that we can do, although frankly it has a pretty small effect <coughs> on the overall piece. Um, water in the environment, this is primarily DPW, um, you know, sewage treatment plant, stormwater regulations, it's my office in terms of site plan, in terms of, of restoration for projects. Working lands, this is preserving working farmlands, working open space. And then they, they finally, I'm almost done, um, they gave us credit for extra stuff that didn't show up in the categories. So we have a few um, that we're proud of, these are just examples, sort of things I know might have aren't better than other ones. Um, but you know, we have endowment funds. We're now up to about $200,000, $300,000 to endow our open space and bike paths. It's nowhere close to one to be. The goal someday is these things are self-sustaining. We're not there yet, but we do have a metric. So every time you buy an acre of open space, we put $200 in the bank. Every time you buy a conservation restriction, we put $100 in the bank. Every time we extend a bike path a foot, we put in, I think it's a dollar per foot or something. So it doesn't, you know, because we, we just started this effort three years ago, it doesn't go very far, but you know, that, that sort of idea is to be sustainable in finance as well as everything else. Um, we designed competition last year. Um, and there were a lot of zoning changes, and part of this is to get a buzz about small lots. We had several small lots and small units that been developed in the last year, I think, part of the result of this. Pedal people, again, is totally our partners, except that the city spends money paying them to pick up the trash downtown and after a waste basket, so part of it. Um, the revolving clean energy account that, that you all talk about and that, that Chris administers, the city stamp program that the mayor does with sort of the, the innovations. And then sort of the final thing is just sort of where we're going in this process. I've talked about the floodplain piece, I've talked about the street trees, you know, Chris is working on the microgrid. This is the area we hope we do do more work on in the future. And I just, um, just pass it up. So this is 
the mayor issued a press release yesterday. You all support, have voted to support getting a grant from American Super Architects um, to help sort of kick off discussion about a framework for a, um, is that copy that wants um, Talk about a framework for a climate adaptation plan. Um, and we got that, so the mayor just announced that yesterday. Um, and the idea is they're becoming in, so this is a team of people from around the country from different disciplines to really help us think about what would a climate adaptation plan cover to get framework to do. It'll be up to the city to actually write the plan. You guys will be involved, climate work will be involved, Chris is off with some um, But this is sort of the kickoff. So they come in May, understand our challenges, probably come back in September with a very, you know, rich public process and get, issue us a report and then go their merry way. We did this exact thing in 2005 before we did sustainable work Hampton. We had a team come out. It really helped promote the public dialogue. And then the next year when we started the sustainable work Hampton plan, I think it sort of gave us all ideas and framework to move forward. That's right. Okay. I want to add, uh, Wade, uh, to this very similar to the New England Municipal Sustainability Directors Network. You help them do kind of similar, not an SDAP, but very similar to that for two communities and I saw their reports on it. I was a little bit, quite, quite put my head around it before, you know, I was kind of trusting those something. When the two communities reported on it, they were glowing. They just found so much benefit out of bringing the experts in and helping them walk through some sticky problems they have in their community um, with getting a lot of input from the, from the community and then move forward with it. So I look forward to this um, going forward. Are there any questions either on STAR or any of this? The information you've shown us, is that what was submitted to STAR or came back from STAR? So that was with both. I mean, in essence, what we did is, these are the ones they approved. We tried other things which they rejected. Okay. So, for example, there's a, a county pattern, a county publication on how many people attend arts venues in different counties, and they never rated Hampshire County. And we said, hey, look, we do really well. We do these awards, we do all this stuff. What do you think? And I figured out if they approved that one or didn't approve that one. So there's some things they didn't approve in the process. And um, can this presentation be put up on the NESC? Sure. Website? Yeah. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. This just reminded me of the, um, the effort to have a tree warden in town. What was the update on that? Which special of these would you order? It's by the mayor. Oh, great. Yeah. But well, Willie's happy? I assume so. <laughs> no. I think they're still wrestling through who's going to be on the commission now. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. um, anything else on the start? Community presentation? Thank you, Wayne. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, I wanted. Uh, I know we skipped over one um, one item on the agenda. I just want to uh, quickly go back to it. We normally have the opportunity for a small public comment period. If anybody, I think we do have some folks from the public. Does anybody have any comments so they are just here to, to sit and listen? Okay. Very good. Um, <coughs> next up, uh, uh, Paul. I think this is yours. It didn't come from you. It came from the city clerk of the city council and. Uh, said the city council has asked the energy commission to um, actually, if you know, if you're clear on exactly what we're supposed to be doing, I think we're just going to be commenting on the ordinance, right? Exactly. Commenting yeah. on the ordinance, and if there was a positive recommend recommendation out of the committee, okay. that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, if the committee wants to take it. Okay. So I don't know how much time you need for this uh, because it kind of came in last minute. I just put it on the agenda. I thought we could at least introduce it. Um, sure. Uh, and if there's time to, um, you know, go through it, I think I, I think there might be time. So it, it takes some time to yeah. Walk so the, this is on the latest iteration. I think way back maybe uh, six months ago, I spoke about this particular this same ordinance, but it's been changed drastically. At that time, that ordinance it began as just a styrofoam. I mean, I'm not going to use the scientific terms, but it was a styrofoam <laughs> man, not a styrene thing. And that's how it began. We had looked initially at doing both a styrofoam band and a single-use plastic bag band. Uh, and at the time, 
actually this is almost a year ago. At that time, it looked like kind of low hanging fruit and the, the part of that ordinance that would be easier to kind of get public support behind was the styrofoam ban. If you remember, it was actually in this committee, because that morning in this committee, when I introduced that, the Boston Globe had an article that kind of looked at styrofoam bans from a climate change perspective and other environmental things and said, you know, banning styrofoam is okay, but it actually, from a couple of standpoints, is environment. Unless you look at what are you going to use instead of the styrofoam, that it actually has some downsides. One of them being that in communities that have banned styrofoam but didn't make a compostable ordinance, that whatever material was used had to be compostable, that you actually had a larger carbon footprint. So Councilor Adams and I looked at this and over a while talked about it and decided that at that point also because of single-use plastic bag ordinances not only in the European Union, where there were 300 million people, or in China, or it was moving through the California legislature with 40 million people, that suddenly seemed like, wait a minute, maybe the styrofoam ban, unless it's compostable, is, might not be as um, kind of easy as a first step as to do a single-use plastic bag ban. We then looked at what it would mean to have both. So I'll come back to the styrofoam ban being a compostable ban. And we ran into, that was one where we started looking at some challenges to that. Now, it's not that we're gonna, not going to come back. I won't be here because I won't be running. But I have the promise of Councillor Adams that next year he will reintroduce this. Because right now what's happening is there are more and more materials out on the marketplace that are compostable and usable. But right now, it would be a challenge. We never wanted to make this um, overly onerous on businesses, especially small businesses. And some of the opposition came from people who were very supportive initially, um, including the owners of uh, uh, State Street. And they talked about the fact that if we were going to make it so that any, um, it, if the product so it, the product that is banned with the styrofoam ban are when meals, meals to go, basically, drinks and meals to go. So they have packaging, which unlike, say, the food co-op, when you go in the food co-op and you do your own salad, you see what you're putting in there. Unfortunately, there are a lot of places when in the morning they're producing the sandwiches and the salads and all of that stuff, and they're putting it in a container so people can see what they're getting. And they said that would be really challenging for us to put it into a closed container. And I, with them, looked at what are some of the alternatives. And they went up from something like a 13 to 15% per container, which was a clear container that they're currently using, which would be banned under the, the styrofoam ban, to a container that would have still been clear, would have been OK under the compostable ordinance, and was going to cost somewhere between 75 cents and 90 cents. And we really looked at the economics of that. It, it was pretty onerous for a number of businesses. So we kind of backed off because we weren't able to, we were trying to find other communities that have done this. So we said, okay, let's, let's go back again. This is gonna be multiple steps. And we said, how about we just drop that for now, come back to that next year, and look at the single-use plastic bags. And as you know, that in the meantime, California passed their ordinance on banning single-use plastic bags. There's the definition in the ordinance. People said, what does that mean? Is that all bags? No, the thicker plastic bags, so we have calls from places like Faces. Their bags are still, they're not considered single-use plastic bags. I forget the exact, the ordinances, get it online, the exact millimeter of the thickness of the bag. But I think we kind of know common sense what we're talking about. So when you go into Stop and Shop, you go into CVS, and they have those rolls of bags. It turned out that we're using, I did this with um, Gary over at um, Cereos. Gary's already way before two years ago stopped using them. And I said, well, when you were using the bags, how many bags a year were you using just at Cereos, which is not a huge supermarket? And he was using a quarter of a million bags a year. So he and I sat down for a while. And we said, okay, let's try and just figure this out. So this is, you know, this is very anecdotal, you know, back of an envelope. But we figure lowballing. We're talking about 8 million bags a year, up to anywhere to 16 million. I know that's a huge range, but even that low figure is startling. And then I looked at what California estimated the number of single-use plastic bags. I divided it by the population. It actually is somewhere around 10 million bags. 
if we use about as many as California uses. Per person. Per, yeah, not per person. <coughs> we don't use 10 million per person. No, no okay. if you extrapolate. <laughs> yeah, if you extrapolate. So we're using a lot of those bags. We have had almost, we've been on the radio twice. There were two or three articles in the paper. We've had, this has gone before committees. We haven't heard a word. And we tried, we reached out through the Chamber's Economic Development Committee, and we said, look, we'd like to meet with all the store owners who will be affected so we can hear, you know, what are some of their concerns. The Chamber reached out, and they said, well, we don't really want to meet with those guys. We said, well, that's fine with us then. And uh, so we're moving forward on it, and we'll answer any questions. We, we've gone back and forth on one part of this. When we looked at this, we modeled it after a number of other communities like ours, and they often have had in their ordinance a square footage that exempted small businesses, somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 square feet, unless you own multiple businesses, so it's total. So if you owned eight little mini-marts in a town, your square footage would then be 12,000 square feet, you would not be exempt. So it's your total business exemption. We've gone back and forth and we continue to. When we went to the, um, um, this is the group that does our health, the uh, public health committee. Um, anyway, they asked us to take that out of there. They asked that they said, Board of Health, Board of Health sorry, yeah. Board of Health, this head cold space. Yeah. The Board of Health. Um, they said we would like it to, to be that everybody, it's under everybody. Um, and that wasn't for environmental reasons, it was just for enforcement reasons. Our own feeling when we go back and forth and we're looking at whether DPW wants to be the enforcing agency, is we don't look at this as anybody going around as enforcing this. We have other ordinances where there are complaint-based ordinances. If you know, a complaint is made against you know, a store that they're still using the bag, stop and shop continues to use them six months down the road, well, then somebody calls in and then we do that. We don't look at this as going around to every store to make sure they're doing that. But the Board of Health was concerned about that, and so we said, okay, we'll take it out. Since then, other folks have said, we wish you'd put that back in. So we're kind of getting feedback on that particular ordinance and see where it goes in, in the committee structure. Have the small businesses said there's a lot of financial harm? Well, in the ordinance itself, there are very liberal and lenient ways in which businesses can get waivers on this if they show any financial harm. Oh. So we're going to err on the side of if somebody comes in and says, "Look, this is really going to harm us," unless it's a you know it's a stop and shop with big Y, they they have a hard time keeping that. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it true last year? Someone mentioned that the Northampton stop and shop uses the most people bring in their own bags more than any other. Stop yeah, and I said that. That North that actually the stop and shop. Stop and shop has actually been a, a pretty good partner in this thing, not just here, but they've experimented in a number of ways. So they went to a couple of years ago, if you remember here, they went to a system where if you brought in your own bag, I believe you got a nickel back yeah. bag, and they did that for a while. And we actually, and so it was to change behaviors. So the, our stop and shop actually uses the highest percentage of people coming in with their own bags. And it was up to something like 40%, yeah. which is pretty high. So the other thing is that in communities that do this, I mean, in the long run, what you're trying to aim for is that people bring in bags that you can use over and over again. Because, you know, paper bags as well use a lot of energy. And what the start of that is when you start banning the plastic bags. And then a place like Stop and Shop, you're going to see, once you stop, start banning the plastic bags, what happens is they're going to start really pushing again for a program where people bring in their own bags. And then for them, that's a real, that's an economic win for them too. I mean, these plastic bags are not expensive, but when they're producing uh, hundreds of thousands a year, probably a couple million to stop and shop, it, it is somewhat costly. Mm -hmm. Well, I scanned through the ordinance and I was curious, there were three different establishments mentioned. I can't remember them now, retail, <coughs> restaurants, retail, and a third. Anyway, two of them said within the city of Northampton and the third did not. I wondered if that was intentional and so on. I'll have to talk to Council Adams. Okay. I'm not sure why that would have been there. But the intent is, this yeah. is a city ordinance. This is a city ordinance. Yeah. I mean, we'd like to pass it for the whole state. <laughs> we'll we try. Uh, and you know, this is, there was, a, uh, Peter Coker said that he was very hopeful, but this was before the current governor was elected, and I spoke to him since, and he doesn't know where this governor would stand. But he was pretty hopeful that 
next fall. We almost held back on this because it looks like the state legislature is moving this forward. It has been in a committee, didn't get out of committee five years ago, didn't get out of committee four years ago. It moved out of committee but then didn't go anywhere three years ago, two years ago. Peter said, it's moving forward and we're going to have this done within a year or two. He thought it would be this fall. Now again, we have a new governor. We're not sure where he stands on this, but it could end up being a statewide. Mm -hmm. So is that the date? So sorry, somewhere in there, the date, 2016, the fall, is that what you're referencing? That no, that's just our own, because oh, that's even if the state passed it, the state would probably pass it, and at that point, it might be 2017. Mm -hmm. We're just giving, trying to give some lead time on this, so we're not saying three months down the road. Again, we're still getting input on that. That's the kind of thing that we wouldn't consider a substantive enough change to rewrite the ordinance and reintroduce the process, but it might be in an amendment that somebody says, why are we waiting until 2016? Why don't we do it six months from now? Or why don't we do it a year and a half from now? So those are the kind of things that an amendment we're very open to, to change. Who came up with the, the penalty fee structure, $50 and $100? We looked at what other communities were doing and talked to the folks in those communities. And we actually asked, you know, what was the feedback you got from the folks in your community when you introduced this. And so that was how we, we kind of looked at that. Again, we're open to changing that. We'll have a couple of public hearings, and the, that's the kind of question we'll raise a public hearing, see what people think of that. Seems that like structure. pretty low to me, almost it's like, like and you can only do, only have a few uh, against you once every seven days. So if someone goes on a, a binge of distributing them, you know, they can only be feed, so maybe, <coughs> It might be a situation where it's actually more financially worth it for them to violate the law. Perhaps. Well, not. Again, what we see mostly, again, it, 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 it kind of like it's similar to the complaint based thing. We see this as public, a lot of public pressure. I mean, it, you know, we'll make sure there's an article and there are letters to the editor of Stop and Shop or Big Y suddenly is, you know, okay, they've decided we'll, we'll afford the $100 every so often. They've been some <laughs> very bad <laughs> And, and, and the thing is to try and balance it with a small business. Yeah. And uh, $100 could, you know, especially if it's every seven days. Sure. And that idea that it's public pressure, I think um, that speaks to, to me preferring there not to be a square footage limit um, because this is about image and people's habits. And if you just have it be like, you know, you're going to pick up your takeout, well, do anything bring that or not, you know, what we want to do is say, you grab that bag. Yeah. And then you see people in town with bags, um, and, you know, no matter where they are in town. So that's I, I yeah. prefer that. Hey, you just gave me a good idea <laughs> for myself personally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a small little bag for the takeout, right? Yeah. I often take a sandwich stick in my pocket. Sometimes the uh, pickle juice loop leaks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what you smell by the way. Exactly. Yeah, and there could be some promotional thing. The city could brand little packable, reusable bag, you know those ones that yeah. kind of come in a pouch. And, and, I mean, know. there's certainly nonprofits that could do this as a whole kind of fundraising thing. So, so I have a question, Paul. Do you have any um, uh, estimates on how much CO2 or energy this CO2 would, would avoid or energy? I don't. You know what I'll do? I'll go back to that. Um, the, the same group that did that Boston Globe article, and I think it came out of Europe, actually. We'll take a look and see what they this If you don't go to the reusable bags, mm -hmm. your CO2 change is not great. Okay. That, I do know that. It's not a great thing. The plastic, to, compared, to paper the plastic and... compared to paper is not a great change. It was surprising to me that on the styrofoam change as well, that actually the styrofoam you had a lower carbon footprint. If you then went to like cardboard cups or plastic cups, it was like, wait a minute, unless they're to unless the cardboard was totally re compostable. Um, so it's interesting, you know, it, 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 in some ways it, it's not quite common sense to think, wow, all those plastic bags, but it takes something to make those paper bags as well. Mm -hmm. So that almost kind of indicates that, um, uh, assuming this ordinance passed, there's something similar to it that uh, the city should consider to the promotion of, of reusable. Yeah. There was a program a few years ago, I think, where um, people were volunteering to sew bags and leave them yeah. at establishments. Well, and that was, well, it actually didn't work well. It was done at uh, Gary's Place on State Street, and they had a whole tree, kind of, you could get a bag, and it was, take a bag, 
leave a bag, right? So you take your bags. If you didn't bring any, you say, oh, there's a bunch of bags up there. They had hundreds and hundreds of bags. People took the bags, but didn't leave the bags. And they were sewing, you know, people were taking care of them. But it was like, he said, it just didn't work. They were out of bags. And then they brought in another couple hundred bags, and they were out of bags. And uh, it was an interesting idea. I'm totally there this and hope we support today. I, 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 I probably feel like this one. I still think the styrofoam one's really important, but not so much from an energy standpoint. It's just that you know it breaks down and then it's really yeah. hard to catch, so it's in streams. And I mean, frankly, the reason I don't, I always want to reduce carbon. The reason I don't care so much the carbon footprint is that the plastic bags are selling to me just in terms of them being in the environment. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the, actually, the big thing here around the Energy Commission isn't really the energy piece on the plastic bags. It's much more in ter terms of solid waste and where these bags end up in the environment. And I forgot the percentage of which I had it, but you know that big Texas size uh, swirling mass of plastic and garbage oh, yeah. in the Pacific? It was some extraordinary number are these thin plastic bags. It, it is really an astounding number, but when you think, in California, it was in the billions per year of these bags. You start thinking of the billions of bags that are used. I know that the big, at the big Y, they have a guy out there, or one of the staff out there, picking plastic bags off the fence once a week, and we still get complaints more often than once a week about how many bags are. And take a ride by and look at yeah. the, the fence that surrounds the big Y, and look at all the plastic bags glued up against it. That's just the parking lot, you know, like a two and a half acre parking lot. Never mind where they get to later. Yeah, and speaking of, uh, I'm not sure if plastic bags are the cause of this, but in the Star Communities piece when we reported our CO2 emissions, as I recall, there were two, there was like city buildings, was one reporting, and then there was overall community was another CO2 one. And uh, that's when I got a hold of the folks at DPW and and, uh, and looked at how much CO2 comes off the landfill. And it dwarfs everything else that the municipality does. I mean, <coughs> so you know, all of our snow plowing, the heating, mm -hmm. you know, heating the pool, JFK, this is just minuscule compared to the amount of CO2 put off by the landfill. Uh, so I don't sure if that's a plastic bags causing all that, <laughs> um, but I mean, um, I mean, just but it's digestion just, or like mm -hmm. the methane. Yeah, the methane. Yeah, methane right. right, and that, and and luck, luckily we. Get, you know, a lot of credit for capturing um, methane as best we can. With, uh, um, uh, but uh, um, so just to go to the point that reducing waste is a CO2 reduction piece. It really clearly is, very, very much so. But in terms of whether this commission can or should support this ordinance, even if it were CO2 neutral or even negative, it's still consistent with the sustainable Northampton right, from the yeah. standpoint of environmental damage. And, uh, solid waste. And, yeah, I would I would go right along with you, Scott, and, and argue that you know as we're talking about the energy efficiency outreach uh, and mobilization plan, which we're hoping to rely on a lot of um, uh, you know social uh, what is community based social marketing, I guess is the term for it. So it's you know not, not Facebook and stuff like that, but it's it's uh, the image that you have with your neighbors, your the. the uh, um, Anyhow, it's kind of like keeping up with Joneses in a way. You know, if people aren't using plastic bags, it's just a higher level of awareness. And it's just, uh, so it's, right, it, it, it builds a norm, um, uh, which I think might have, might go beyond that. So I agree with Phil. So, Paul, oh, you're co sponsoring this with yeah. the Reds. I don't know. Are we looking for, what language are we looking for to come out of this commission? If this commission, I don't know if you, we have done this much because I don't know how many ordinances we voted on, but we're looking for positive recommendations out of any committee. So if this committee wants to vote with a positive the recommendation to sending it forward, I don't think. Versus. I just don't know what words we're trying to put into a proposal. So we I, mean, I, mean, I guess I'd move we recommend a city council adopt. Okay. That, that, right. Is that, is that Wait, a motion? Would it be a motion? Okay. Is that what you're looking for with the amendments that you sent? One it would be the current. Um, I don't. I didn't bring it with me today, but it would be the. Which includes the overview of the amendments. So yes. The yes. I have copies of everyone wants to look at. So we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second. 
Thanks, Pat Sackman. Uh, any further discussion? Sorry, what was the motion? motion was uh, to recommend to recommend the city <coughs> to adopt the ordinance as amended. So with no, what do you step forward for further discussion? Um, should we call the vote? Um, all in favor of the motion? I see everybody's hands up. That's the voting member. So I think Ben don't have to call for any opposing. Ben passed. Okay. Just one last thing. Be helpful for any minutes for any vote. Thank you. Okay, so um, next on the agenda is um, uh, want to bring a status report on the Community Energy Efficiency Outreach Plan. Uh, as <coughs> folks know, there was a work group that met on this. Um, uh, uh, the reason why is because we have a grant opportunity to actually hire someone to, uh, to help us come up with a, uh, a mobilization outreach plan. And um, I have to say it was a really good meeting, very, very helpful. I, I thought it just it had lots of good ideas come out of there. Um, uh, and there were a few things, a few decisions that came out. So one of them um, uh, in particular, I want to make sure the full commission is uh, behind this. Um, <coughs> the, the, what, the, what we're stepping forward to do right now is, is we, since we want to get help in developing a plan, we want that based on demographics and measurable metrics. We need to identify which demographics this is going to be based on, and I'm talking about housing type, age of housing, um, you know, how long has someone lived in their house. Uh, the commission really started, I mean, the working group really started to flesh some of these ideas out. We didn't have a lot of time, so it was really meant as a starter conversation, but there were great ideas coming out. Um, uh, and, uh, and so we're going to have to hire someone to help pull this data together, kind of map the community so that we have an idea. <coughs> uh, where is the low-hanging fruit uh, as far as doing outreach for energy efficiency? Where are there barriers? What kind of barriers? And how might we get o overcome those barriers? Um, actually, someone preferred me not to use the word barriers. I can't remember. Oh, the primary, yeah. <laughs> right. Obst okay, obstacles. Right. Right. Um, and no, no, uh, don't use roadblocks. That was my. Okay, point. I didn't use. I didn't. I don't think I ever used the word roadblocks. Came up at the meeting. I okay. Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and so part of the reason the, the, the work with people, what they're helping me do at the moment is to identify um, what skills are needed by whatever organization we hire. First of all, what data do we want to gather? And once you understand what kind of data you want, then you're going to better understand what skills uh, an organization would need to gather that data. Um, and then uh, any kind of planning effort possibility, kind of identify that. Uh, so there will be... Um, uh, an RFP going out uh, to hire someone or maybe a couple of different groups to help us gather this data. And um, I wanted to have a selection committee help us go through that. And then the question was, for this whole thing, does the selection committee act as a steering committee? And um, the working group really wanted it, to, and it was pretty universal across, they wanted the energy commission to be the steering committee. So um, just really to guide this whole effort would be the energy committee. Uh, commission, um, and that the Energy Commission, and possibly through the work group, is the ones who will help us select who is on the selection committee. Um, uh, so, uh, if that, I just want to at least put that out. I don't know if we need a formal vote on this or anything. I just wanted to let the full commission know that that is the um, the kind of structure that's being set up, and to make sure the commission is comfortable with that. Did you, anybody else that was there? Christina, Aiden, um, let's see who don't. See, not that you're not on the pit. Paul, you were there. Is that, am I, am I picking it correctly here? My only concern on that is if we're the steering committee, and a key component would be, would we be the group then selecting who we're going to use, creating a criteria and selecting who we might use as a consultant? And my concern is not that we do that. My concern is that we're able to get a quorum each time. Right. If we have multiple meetings that we have to do that. And if each time it gets under this committee, each time 
we had better have a quorum. And I'm right. okay. not sure we'll have it. No, it would be, the selection committee would be a separate group. Okay. Right. And it may only have one representative from the Energy Commission. Okay. So, and it would not be a... Right, that's it. You know, it would not be a public... Um, that, that the selection committee would be like any... Okay, selection that's right. You talked about that at our meeting. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm not getting any feedback. Is there any kind of a case? What do you do with the selection committee? Give a proposal, a recommendation for the Yeah, I could, I could see us, I could see us coming up with who we should, who, who should be on the selection committee and bring that to the end. No, I mean, from after the selection committee does their thing, do they then submit a, a party and we adopt, or, or they just make the decision? No, I think they make the decision. Right, they make the decision at that point. There, is there anyone on the subcommittee that is not on? Um, we had. Uh, not okay at the moment it's a work group I mean this has never been done before it's one reason why I've, you know the process is being kind of struggled through and I, I really am taking the point of view of it's too urgent to go fast so I want to make sure we really have good information coming in um, the Energy Commission took off as a work group but that might not be the selection committee they're basically helping me just define how to move forward on this they're just giving me advice on how to move forward and uh, because it was an open meeting, we had a number of people, two of them here are here at the, the meeting right here, uh, who showed up and sat at the table and provided input. Um, they have experience. They're working in the fields, uh, in the field in this way. Um, so what I'm wondering is if we form a steering committee. If I heard you right, you want, you're asking if the commission should be the steering <coughs> committee to the subcommittee? <laughs> I know. <it's> looking, <laughs> This is what came out of the work group. <laughs> if, if that's the case, you're you're eliminating the possibility of members of the subcommittee being on that steering committee, right? No. I think the steering committee was the commission would be the steering committee for the selection committee. Okay. Not the sub group okay. subcommittee. Right. Right. Okay. Exactly. And is that okay that, that people are excluded because they're not commission members from being on the steering committee to the selection? <laughs> is anyone going to feel left out? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't believe so. I mean, I think if I was normally, the city's got a grant. City government has got a grant, and if I was going to hire a consultant of some kind, <coughs> I would pick a selection committee. I'm off, it's often done with city staff. Mm -hmm. Maybe bring someone else in. This isn't just municipal operations, so I don't think we should rely just on city staff. I think there's some other experts out there. Mm -hmm. Who, who should that be? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, so this, you know, the decision really could be a staff decision mm -hmm. on forming a selection committee. I'm just I using think. the input from the community through the Energy Commission to help inform that process. Um, and, and it wasn't me that said the Energy Commission should be the steering committee. That actually came from why does the selection committee need a steering committee? Good question. Well, devil's advocate <laughs> question. Why can't we just form a selection? Um, I think um, <coughs> that's a good, good way of putting it. I think you think of the steering committee as for the whole process. Once we, oh. so it won't be just the selection committee. Once the steering, once the selection committee has picked someone, then just, then the energy commission will continue to help oversee the entire development of the plan. Um, yeah, I think we did it to keep. Are this committee involved in the process yeah, because so. the selection committee we were talking about the, the pe pretty diverse different organizations or business owners from the mm -hmm. community that have you know a more objective and broader right. perspective so I think that was right. the goal to keep it I think it's in context think, so that we have right. oversight <coughs> and involvement throughout okay. yeah I think I think that's probably the best way of putting it thanks yeah it was make sure that the Energy Commission actually stay, had some involvement still yeah yeah What's hard? Thing that clears is, blood? <laughs> it's kind of hard. We're not sure what we're looking for exactly. It's almost like we're going to invite proposals to a solution for this problem that we have. And not, they might be different. And that's kind of what I'm a hard, having a hard time thinking about all this process to manage yeah. something that we don't know what that's going to be. And that's the reason there is a lot of process because we don't have a real clear cut. You know, we, there, is, there isn't a, a plan to follow out there so far. But that's becoming clearer. It is. Seriously, becoming clear. The last meeting actually helped me a lot. 
Um, and some follow-up, which I'll go over here, is that there'll be some more. Uh, so, um, uh, okay, well, I don't think we need a formal vote on this. It's, it was actually Bill Dwight that suggested this structure, and he's not here to speak to it. Um, Just saw him on Facebook, he said. <laughs> He's ill. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Oh, goodness, hope it feels better. Well, for that, I'll just leave it as an announcement because I don't think we need to have a formal. Um, um, okay. I would just ask that in the future we get some definition on what the roles of the steering committee are going to be. Gotcha. But I'm leaving this discussion really unclear on that. All right. Like, is it just reporting to the steering committee or reguiding policy? Right. Will okay. we be expected to take make decisions? I don't think so. That's not the steering committee does, right? Um, no. I actually think we need to check on the new, because we've run into problems. It, it, you brought this up at the beginning. I'm not sure. We can't, I wouldn't even call us a steering committee. I would take those words completely out of it right now. Okay. In terms of open meeting law and other things, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how you do that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's changed in the last year. And so I, this whole thing about steering committee, or now we're a steering committee, or whatever, I don't think that language we should even use. It's that this committee this is under our jurisdiction, and it continues to be under our jurisdiction. That's all. OK. But I might even, going back to the question, whoever raised that, do we meet often or not? I might even just sort of stress, I think ultimate decisions are staff. We hope you always listen to what the commission says. But if it doesn't work, if the meetings don't work, it's yeah. not that we legally have to make it. And that's why I was concerned about a steering committee that we somehow empower to make that decision formally out of this committee. I don't think we should do that. I agree. Okay, that's very good. I'm glad I brought it up to everybody. Um, that's that's better than a vote. It's what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> don't take it. Right, right. Um, uh, okay, I'm just going to give a quick update. Um, uh, on a few other things that have come from there. So you'll, you'll see, I, I did send out the minutes for that meeting as well. And if anybody's interested, they could read through them. I think the minutes are pretty clear. Of that meeting. I also have to go. Am I going to screw up your form if I go? No, I don't have. But I'm going to. Is that screw up your form? I do not have. I don't, no I don't need a vote. Okay, unless, unless we want to vote to adjourn and we can't. <laughs> yes. I'll see you <laughs> here next <laughs> month. <laughs> Sleep off into the night. Okay. Right. Okay, just to um, uh, a, quick, a few quick updates. So one thing that was highlighted was the, the need for data from these buildings. And I've done a little follow-up on that. Um, uh, and it sounds like very soon there is going to be an online form that you can just search in order to look for um, energy efficiency. I'm not quite clear of what exactly will be there. I'm not sure what level it will be at. Um, but uh, I've been in communication with someone at National Grid, um, and this should also pertain to Columbia Gas, uh, but they can get me data on an annual basis uh, from 2012 to the present. Um, the question is when they say annual, does that mean you have anything on 2015? I, I don't think so. They haven't answered that yet. The data will be by sector, residential, commercial, low income. It'll include consumption. It'll include program participation by program, including number of participants, savings, and incentive dollars. And what's unclear is the geographic range. They haven't told me whether it's a zip code. I've asked very strongly for less than zip code, smaller, um, you know, uh, census, you know, like a federal census block or something like that. Uh, but they haven't gotten back to me on that. So, number one, we um, I've got a request out there. I don't know if I've done the official request, uh, but there will soon be a statewide database that you can search online. So that's a piece to report back. I think everybody should find interesting. And then one thing that came out was Mary Biddle uh, mentioned this group that's doing Map My Energy, Enerscore. Um, and I do have a hand, just, sure, just pass this around. It, that's kind of a print out of their entire website. They're really up, just up, up and coming, but or not, not, they're a startup. They haven't gotten a contract with anybody yet. They're supposed to be working with Renew Boston and um, um, uh, next step living, but they don't have a contract with them. So, and but here's what they're looking at doing: they're looking at using public record data um, in order to map a community um, 
uh, based on uh, cost effectiveness to upgrade, um, uh, cost best benefit ratio based on a HERS rating versus the cost, um, and recommending different types of uh, efficiency upgrades for different types of buildings. Um, so it's like, this is kind of what we're looking to doing. Um, I'm really possibly interested in seeing that. I want to talk to them further. Um, uh, did there, so there's someone else doing something very similar to what we're trying to do right now. We take it further. We actually want to expand that out to surveys and demographics, um, possibly focus groups. Um, but it's, I think it's encouraging to know that's out there. Um, and that would give you a metric to decide where to target the outreach efforts? Right. That's what we're trying to aim that's for. Cool. Exactly. Right. Instead of, you know, the whole one thing that learning piece was when we reached out to Ryan Road because they were all electric, and then we found out that they weren't necessarily all electric, mm -hmm. and they were houses were built on very wet lands, and so the options were very limited, and they flopped. We we didn't, you know, get anybody to do anything else. So the whole <coughs> idea is to kind of really identify how do we how do we plan out outreach throughout North Hampton. And again, when people are having trouble, for whatever reason it is, doing energy efficiency, how do we identify those, those, uh, those obstacles uh, so that we can then find ways to possibly help them overcome that um, to make the whole community. Um, all right, um, and then the last thing is the committee did ask, or the work group wanted a, um, to start compiling ideas on different groups we could partner with or different resources that we could share. And they asked uh, me to do that through a Google Docs and through a Dropbox. Uh, so the Google Docs, you probably all should have gotten an email. Uh, I started, started that, if anybody has ideas to help out with this, just go ahead and put it in. Um, the community, anybody else in the community can, can look at it. Um, I only gave people who were on this commission or who were at the meeting, so I gave a few folks that were. I didn't get anything yet. Okay, it should came out this afternoon. It should be. Oh. If not, get a hold of me. Okay. Okay, because okay. if you guys want to provide input, mm -hmm. um, be happy to have it. Uh, so that's why you decided to start pulling the information in. Um, Chris, I thought you yeah. said that the, the commission members, the, the people that are on the distribution list, would be read only as well. Uh, no, it shouldn't have been. Oh. Did I say that? I, Maybe I missed. That's what I'm remembering. Okay. No, there's um, there's a link that you can send out to anybody that's just read only. Uh -huh. Oh, that was for further forwarding of it. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. And um, and at the moment, just the commission members and the four people who showed up at, from the public who were in, and were helpful in that conversation, I included them um, as editable. Mm -hmm. They can they can edit that piece. Um, um, because we do want to kind of keep this open meeting, I do want to have you know, anybody be able to provide input. Uh, so if anybody from the community wants to provide input, they can get a hold of me and see if they can put something in. Uh, does anybody else have anything else you want to kind of bring out regarding that work group? Have you set a date yet for the next? Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Actually, it's one of the things on my notes here. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have for everybody. We either have next work group meeting is either going to be on February 24th um, from 10 to 11:30 or 1 to 2:30. Uh, everybody but Paul was available, and on Wednesday the 25th from 10 to 11:30, everybody but Christina was available. And that's the only reason I should have had Paul stay here is to see if there's any way we can tweak that timing. Yeah, Wednesday the twenty. So it's either two, either Tuesday the twenty fourth. Yeah, clock is called. Both both morning and afternoon. Okay, because if you could make. Oh, actually, this is the time that Paul can't make. Okay. Uh, time I just that, one time. Yeah, time, time that you can't make would be we only had one time there. So I guess I'll I'll either grab. I'll even put a note, I'll just take one of that, but if there was a suggestion well, here, I'm going to And I, I'm going to be able to push them my call back, so if it's, it's not. So you could possibly I make. I could possibly do that. The 25th? Mm -hmm. it, it's a weekly standing call, so I could probably be scheduled in more. Okay, well then why don't we just go ahead and call it right now. So the next meeting would be on the 25th. At what time? 
uh, at 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. And I will let everybody know where, most likely the City Hall hearing room at the same time. Well, and I will add too, I mean, for the guys that weren't at so, I mean, I know it all seems kind of nebulous right now, but I think, like Chris said, I think it really was a very productive meeting, at least in terms of strategies that we talked about for reaching out to communities in different ways that once we get someone to compile all the data and figure out the best way to mobilize the plan, I think a lot of good really came out of the meeting and maybe you guys can mm -hmm. attest to that as well. But so it, you know, it sounds like, well, what do they really do? And there's a steering committee and a selection committee and committee for the committee. But it, I, I think aside from all that, I think it was very productive. That's, that's, that's not what we spend all our time talking about. <laughs> just that's with all the boring stuff. <laughs> exactly. We yeah. start the points for that. And if you, if you read the minutes, it does kind of give you a good idea of what, what we talked about. Um, um, uh, we're about out of time. Uh, I don't have any particular status update for ongoing projects or grants right now, but if anybody has any questions, so I'll take the last few minutes for that. Another one for that, I think we would wrap up. The, the one I remember having a bit of a timing element was the LED um, street lighting. Well, you street light, okay, yeah. right. Just because there was a seasonal aspect to it, but it wasn't like it was in a rush. It just right. No, that was moving along fairly nicely, actually. Okay, right. so we're not we're not slipping on it. Anyway. No, there. Um, well, just to clarify, there there was a need to um, notify National Grid that we were going to change rate tariffs, and we had to do that before the end of the last year, mm -hmm. or we would have lost. We would have had to wait for a whole year. Oh, right. right. That happened. Okay. So we're on board, mm -hmm. and. Uh, everybody, we've been meeting the mayor's group, the whole thing moving forward. Um, uh, we've now looked at the Siemens contract, um, uh, and it, that is that is now starting to move forward. No decision whether to use it or not. Um, it's a maybe a strong leaning to use it. Um, I think once we have some actual meetings with Siemens, and um, uh, once we see the audit, uh, which will be coming to city council, in front of city council, it's one of those things where. If Siemens does the audits and we move forward to actually doing the upgrade, then the audit doesn't cost us anything. Mm -hmm. But if we cancel, then the, we have to pay for the audit. So the city council is going to have to approve some money for that before we go forward. Yeah. You'll still pay for it. You just won't. Exactly. Have a line item. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> well, let's put it this way. If we went for construction and we just told them what to do without the audit, we'd still pay for the audit. Right. <laughs> Cause, uh, the markups are locked in at this point. Um, I think that's it. Anything else from anybody else? All right. I move we adjourn, even if we can't vote on it. <laughs> <laughs>